Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario Health. Manage your blood glucose levels. Increase your possibilities. By Jivo Kypopen, the first premixed auto injector for very low blood sugar. And by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, Kyle Banks is a Broadway performer, singer, dancer, actor who's diagnosed with type 1 while in a production of The Lion King and had to figure out, pretty much on his own, how to manage on stage. I would have to go into work with my glucose hovering around 300, 350. And by either intermission or the end of the show, my glucose would crash and I would experience these crazy hypoglycemic episodes. And it was really scary for a while. He's come a long way, Kyle explains, how he learned what he needed to do to perform at his best. And now Kyle has started a foundation to help get diabetes technology into the hands of more people who need it. Plus, I got some feedback from you about our last episode. I'll share that and a little bit about back to school. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to another week of the show. Always so glad to have you here. You know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. So much great feedback from our last episode where I interviewed my son, Benny, diagnosed before he was two. Now he's 16. And he went away for a month this summer to Israel without us with a non-diabetes camp program. So if you've listened and you sent me feedback, I really appreciate it. As I shared during that episode, I was nervous because we are far from perfect. There were some funny bits too. I'll share a few of those after the interview. But guys, really, thank you so much. It is amazing to have that kind of support. I really appreciate you. I met Kyle Banks at Friends for Life this summer. Lucky enough to travel to that in-person conference. Kyle gave a welcome speech to new families that were there for the first time. And I knew I had to talk to him, but I heard from a bunch of families who came up to me later and said, are you going to interview Kyle? You know, what a great voice. (laughs) And boy, does he have a great voice and what a terrific story. He was diagnosed with type 1 nearly six years ago in November of 2015. And as you'll hear the story, he was performing. Uh, He had made his career on Broadway. And to me, it just seems like performing in that kind of venue, on that kind of energy you need to put in, it's like being a professional athlete. So I was very interested to talk to him. And I was really surprised, and, and you may be too, as you listen, to hear how he started off with truly very little guidance. Of course, he has come a long way. And he shares how he did it, where he turned for advice, what he's using now. And he also talks about his foundation, and that is Kyler Cares. We're going to talk about the benefit concert that helped that foundation from Broadway with Love. It's called, I'll link that up at diabetes-connections.com, and you can watch really the incredible performances, very entertaining. I am going to play a clip of Kyle singing from that in just a moment, and then we're going to go right into the interview. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Jivo Kaipo Pen. You know, low blood sugar feels horrible. You can get shaky and sweaty or even feel like you're going to pass out. There are a lot of symptoms. They can be different for everybody. I'm so glad we have a different option to treat very low blood sugar. Jivo Kaipo Pen. It's the first auto injector to treat very low blood sugar. Jivo Kaipo Pen is pre-mixed, ready to go with no visible needle. Before Jivo, people needed to go through a lot of steps to get glucagon treatments ready to be used. This made emergency situations even more challenging and stressful. This is so much better. I'm grateful we have it on hand. Find out more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the GVOC logo. GVOC shouldn't be used in patients with pheochromocytoma or insulinoma. Visit gvocglucagon.com slash risk. One of these mornings, you're gonna rise up singing and you'll spread your wings and take to the sky but till that morning baby there ain't nothing that can harm you with daddy and mama standing by 
Nee. Kyle, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to talk to you. Your story is so unique. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of the show, for sure. That's great. We have so much to talk about. Let me just start, if I could, at the beginning. Uh, your diagnosis story happened while you were you were living your dream, right? You were performing on, on Broadway. You were touring. Tell me about when you were diagnosed with diabetes. Well, I was diagnosed in November of 2015, um, and I'm an actor, vocalist, um, and so I, I hop, as usually I hop between like the Broadway cast and the touring company of The Lion King, and I was on tour at the time, and we were um, touring like Canada and California, and I just began feeling, having these crazy symptoms, like exhaustion and uh, the constant, the need, the urge to constantly urinate, and then I what really scared me to death was the fact that I lost uh, thirty pounds over the course of like three weeks, and so that was the um, trigger that made me go to the doctor to see what was going on with me, and that's when um, I was told that suspected that I was diabetic based on my um, the glucose uh, test that that he administered um, in the urgent care office. Unfortunately, I was on steroids at the time, so the physician that was treating me suspected that maybe it was steroid-induced type 2 diabetes. Oh, wow. So he prescribed, he prescribed metformin for me and uh, told me, he, he suggested I go to the emergency room, but my response was, but I have a show tonight, so that's not possible. Like, what can we do to get through this? So I, I went and picked up my prescription of metformin and went to the show, uh, to the theater, still feeling awful. And over the course of the next three weeks, of course, the metformin did absolutely nothing to help with the symptoms that I was experiencing. And that landed me in the hospital for, uh, for three days. And that's when I was properly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. But still, um, up until being hospitalized, I was working and doing the show, which was, looking back on it, which was really crazy because the show is the, such a high-intensity show, one yeah. that requires a lot, of, a lot of energy, most of which I did not have. Let me just jump in jumped. because we're going to talk about performing on Broadway and what that does to your body and the energy you need. The Lion King, which we've been fortunate enough to see, is nonstop. What was it like during right. that time? Do you re can you share? I mean, I, I can't even imagine. You must have slept all day and just performed the best you could, and then gone right back to bed. Yeah, for that was my life. I was I was literally in bed all oh, day, wow. um, up until the time I would go to work. And I would drag myself into the theater, and usually we're running around during the entire show, just acting, just like complete crazy fools in the back. You know, the cast is it's so much, the show's so much fun to be a part of, being in the cast. I'm in the camaraderie backstage during the show, and the energy is always high and festive. And so, I, of course, I participated in none of that. When I wasn't on stage, I was either like in my dressing room trying to just replenish any amount of strength that I could or sitting in my station where we get dressed while the show is happening. It was definitely a huge struggle pushing through just that time. And even after my diagnosis, it took a while for my energy to return because my glucose levels were so all over the place. Uh, when I was diagnosed, one of the great, I, I, you shared with me a bit about your son's experience and the fact that he had amazing doctors that he had access yeah. to. And I, I did the same thing with me, but you know, my doctor's, were not able to tell me once they prescribed insulin for me and showed me how to incorporate that into like management of diabetes. But they did not share with me the struggles that I would have taking insulin and being so active. That was something that I had to figure out on my own. So, you, um, they, and, so they give you a prescription for insulin. I assume they put you on shots and send you back out to perform. <laughs> it sounds like with very little right. instruction of, you know, right. exercise is going to bring you down and eating is going to kind of level you out or I don't even know. So when you got back to your first weeks or months of performances, 
Do you mind sharing a little of the trial and error? I can't imagine. As you've already said, it it wasn't a smooth transition back. Oh, God, no. You know, it's crazy because I actually went to New Orleans. I traveled to New Orleans to visit my mom's doctor. And she told me to go to the emergency room. And that's when I was hospitalized for three days. So then once I was released, I, I flew to Denver where the show was and uh, jumped right back into the show with now my new regimen for diabetes management, which included finger pricks, which I would do like sometimes 12 or 12 finger pricks during the show and uh, this insulin regimen. But immediately after the first show, I remember my glucose crashed down to uh, like the low 20s. And this became a pretty consistent situation for me where I would have to go into work with my glucose hovering around 300, 350. And by either intermission or the end of the show, my glucose would crash and I would experience these crazy hypoglycemic episodes. And it, it was really scary for a while. And this went on for months. And I knew that I just could not continue in this route because I was reading that, you know, the fluctuations are really dangerous. And not only could you, you know, pass out and have a seizure if one's glucose goes too low, but, you know, could also bring about complications as well. So I knew I had to figure out a better system for my lifestyle and this new diagnosis that I was now living with. So after about nine months after, um, actually a full year after my diagnosis, the show just happened to travel to New Orleans and we were there for a month. And at the end of that run, I decided to take some time off from work to figure out how to better care for myself and to figure out if I would even be able to continue on performing uh, at this level. And, and just really figure out a plan for, for my care. Wow. Well, we know how the story ends, that you are still performing when you can. <laughs> so what made the difference? How did you figure it out? Right back to Kyle answering that question. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario. And one of the things that makes diabetes management difficult for us that really annoys me and Benny, it isn't actually the big picture stuff. It's all those little tasks that add up. I mean, are you sick of running out of strips? Do you need some direction or encouragement going forward with your diabetes management? Would visibility into your trends help you on your wellness journey? The Dario Diabetes Success Plan offers all of that and more. No more waiting in line at the pharmacy. No more searching online for answers. No more wondering about how you're doing with your blood sugar levels. Find out more. Go to mydario.com forward slash diabetes dash connections. Now back to Kyle talking about how he figured out how to thrive on stage and avoid those huge lows. Just having that time to, the Lion King can be all consuming when you're doing the show between rehearsals and the actual show and the adrenaline that comes in and being getting prepared for it and, and once the once the curtain comes down. So it doesn't really leave much time for other activities. But having the time off, I was able to just really do a lot of research and digging online and social media. I discovered Beyond Type One and children with diabetes and just a lot of various resources that could um, a different podcast like such as yours. Oh, um, I listen to a, a lot of shows which with people just talking about how they care for themselves, and there's such a varied cast of people talking about their experiences. Athletes and teachers, and I mean, it's just a varied cast. So I was able to really just dig in and hear what other people were doing, and take certain things that I could apply to to my situation and really help me by when I went back to work, I now had a plan of action. I could test it out and discovered that it actually worked. Um, I could go into work with my glucose hovering around 120. I make sure I had lots of snacks with me and a small meal that I would eat without insulin during intermission. Um, and then another small meal after the show without insulin. And I was just so shocked that I was able to, I didn't experience the crashes. 
anymore. And I was able to just maintain my level of activity um, in a safe way. And I mean, I'm just so thrilled that this information was available to me. Um, I just had to do a little digging to find it. So, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like, if I'm hearing you correctly, that you went outside the traditional medical sphere, right? It sounds like you got all yeah. of your information from the community. Pretty much. Pretty wow. much. I know that my situation is very different than the other patients that my physicians mm. were treating. Initially, I thought, well, the way Kyla Cares came about was uh, when I was in New Orleans with the time off from work, I reached out, also reached out to Children's Hospital because I figured that would be a great route to find out how the, we're basically, you know, in the theater, we're basically big kids running around <laughs> stage or running around the theater. So I figured that there would be a lot of insight that maybe the kids or uh, the kids would be able to give me as it relates to how they manage. And so I connected with Children's Hospital. I was already connected with them because we do a lot of outreach through Disney and with uh, Shriners Hospital and Children's Hospital. So it was rather easy to connect with them. And that's when I discovered that the kids were having horrific outcomes as well as it relates to glucose management. And I was really moved by the fact that the uh, endocrinology team was stressing to me just the effects that this disease is having on communities of color, specifically kids of color, and how they were having different outcomes than their Caucasian patients. And it really struck me. And months after that initial meeting, I was just harping on the information that I was given. And that's how, initially, that's how Kyla Cares came to be as a result of that meeting at Children's Hospital with uh, the endocrinology team. We're going to talk about Kyle Cares, and we're going to come back to these disparities that are just, they're heartbreaking and they are real. Just to finish kind of on your experience, you were able to go back and perform. And as you said, you, you mm -hmm. kind of bounce, I don't know if that's the right word, you kind of go back and forth between the Broadway cast, the touring cast. I know everything's messed up now because mm -hmm. of COVID, but yeah. From, yeah. from the time you went back, were you able to go back to the roles that you had been performing and, and loving before your diagnosis? Yes, I was. I'm just so happy to have been able to figure out how to do that safely because I, I did it for so many months, luckily without any horrific events happening, like me passing out on stage or, mm. or even behind the stage for that matter. I was able to make it through that very scary time period without any of that happening. Um, and I'm very lucky to have not had a seizure with my glucose being so low so often. But yeah, I was able to, to figure out how, how to do it and how to continue doing all of the things that I loved. And, and like I said, it was the community, the, the information that so many people are just so eager to share online that really helped me push through. What technology do you use now? I use uh, the Omnipod insulin pump and the Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. Are you able to, I think I know the answer to this, but are you able to kind of hide that stuff under your costumes or is it shown? I'm curious I, what that looks like. I, I am, you know, the uh, wardrobe department uh, at Lion King was so supportive and just, just extremely loving and nurturing mm -hmm. through this whole period. Because uh, when I was first outfitted with my Omnipod, I was so concerned that it would cause problems for wardrobe. And when I brought it in and showed it to them on my arm, it's like, oh, that's no problem. So they made me um, a flesh tone band for my arm cool. and for my abdomen uh, that I could wear. Because there are scenes in the show where we're, we're bare on top. And uh, it was a pretty simple fix. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I think they made my slip covers in like two minutes, like maybe like five <laughs> minutes before that, that, that first show when I was wearing it. It was, a, it was a really simple fix. That's cool. All right, let's talk about Kyle Cares. I am going to come back and ask you a lot of Broadway questions later, but let's talk about Kyle <laughs> Cares right now. This is your nonprofit. Um, as you mentioned, this provides mm -hmm. grants. You do a lot of work to get technology for, for children, for young adults with type 1. And right. I've done a, a little bit of reporting over the years, frankly, not as much as maybe we all need to be thinking about, but some reporting on the racial and ethnic disparities, because it's really mm -hmm. incredible when you dig into it. 
when you look at use of insulin pump technology, it's something yeah. like, you know, one fifth of black children compared to white children mm -hmm. using pumps. From my understanding, and Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not always because of income or education or insurance. You know, it's mm -hmm. a question of, well, I don't know. You tell me I shouldn't be talking to you about this. Tell me what you have found out. What should we be thinking about? Yeah, you know, that's that was my thought as well when I when we first began like digging into Kyla Cares and figuring out, you know, how we wanted to help. So we figured providing grants that can go towards the technology would be the most beneficial route. And uh, we soon discovered that, you know, the complicated the, the situation is is much more complicated than just uh, uh, the, the financial barriers that uh, keep people from accessing the technology, especially with kids. The stigma surrounding diabetes, specifically type 1 diabetes, is just really high. And a lot of kids, even the ones that have insurance and have their parents have the, the financial means to access the technology, they still don't want to wear them because they don't want to feel different than their peers or they don't want the attention that wearing these medical devices on their bodies brings into their lives. We've discovered that a lot of what is needed is well, one diabetes education, just making sure that families of color have like the basic information needed to care for themselves for a loved one living with the disease. You know, things like, you know, reinforcing the latest glucose management practices and why CGMs and pumps are beneficial and you know, ways to avoid you know, hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, you know, pre-bolusing, uh, movement, like walking after meals and using, incorporating more water into one's daily water intake as a way to flush excess glucose out. I mean, simple things like this, we're finding that many parents and people living with the disease aren't aware of. I mean, especially those that have been living with the disease for an extended period of time. It's sort of like they phased out of all of the latest information as it relates to care or management of this disease. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of confidence building that needs to happen, especially within communities of color. Yeah. Do you think that, and listen, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know that you are not an, you know, you're not an endocrinologist, you are not a perhaps an anthropologist, you know, as I set these questions up. But, you know, I think it's so important that we try to talk about these things openly. And I wonder if, as you talk about better education for the patients and trying to get these kids and their families to, you know, be more accepting or look at different, you know, technology, not worry about fitting in. What about the endocrinologists themselves? Do you think that there is a, is a problem or a situation here where without meaning to even, right? I mean... I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, Kyle, but I guess what I'm asking is, do you think they treat patients of color differently? They don't say, hey, here's a CGM or here's a pump or here's a... Are you finding that sometimes the endos are not trusting their patients? I'm not even sure how to phrase it, but they're not, they're not giving them the opportunities to use the yeah, technology. Yeah. This is indeed true. I'm discovering that a lot of patients living with type 1, uh, especially people of color, are, are not even being offered the latest technology or, or technology in general to help them with, uh, with management. And I mean, and there's so many things that go into that. There's a shortage of endocrinologists, yeah. so it's really hard to get an appointment. A lot of these endocrinologists are overworked. The cultural differences that many endocrinologists face when dealing with patients can be intense in those moments when you only have 30 minutes or an hour with someone to try and figure out why they're having so many problems and just not being able to relate to like the human being that's sitting in front of you and their lived experiences. I mean, it does create uh, these situations that eventually lead to, to horrible outcomes for, for the patient. So, and I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, all endocrinologists are Approaching these situations with ill intent, I, I just think it's just the way things are set up right now, or the way the way the system is set up. It's not serving the patients, yeah. especially specifically patients of color, well. So yeah, those, those issues uh, are do exist, and um, we need more endocrinologists of color or more doctors to go into endocrinology into the field, and we 
we need we need some culturally sensitive training for endocrines for Caucasian in endocrines uh, that are treating people of color as well. While these are tough issues to talk about, you made an interesting point earlier about the way you found the care that has helped you through the most, and that was through the community. And I think that right. that's a story that I've heard over and over and over again by people who belong to all different types of racial, ethnic, socioeconomic you know, different groups, mm -hmm. we come, we, right. you know, when I've done this, I've said, hey, I have something I want to try. I bring it to our endocrinologist. And he says, oh, great idea. Sure. He didn't suggest it. It doesn't mean that he's holding back something or trying to keep it from me. He just was, right. you know, for whatever reason, we have a fabulous endo. You know, that wasn't something that was on mm -hmm. his radar. And I wonder, too, right. just in the last couple of years, we finally had these discussions about getting more people of color at conferences represented in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, JDRF, Beyond Type right. 1, uh, Friends for Life, as you mentioned, Children with Diabetes. You went to the Children with Diabetes Friends for Life conference in July. We met for about three seconds. So thanks for, for that. I yeah. really I ran up to <laughs> Kyle as he was trying to start speaking. And I was like, you have to come on the show. It's great to meet you. <laughs> but just being there. I always say we were so lucky because I saw people in the community that looked just like my son and my family from the very beginning. It didn't yes. even occur to me that we weren't yes. represented. A long way of saying, Kyle, going to Friends for Life this summer, I've got to assume that you met some families of color, that you felt that you were there to have these kinds of conversations. Not just for that. I mean, you have so many great stories to tell. Mm -hmm. But let's start there. What was that like for you this summer? It was an amazing experience, and Children with Diabetes is actually uh, one of the organizations that uh, where Kyla Cares is partnered with um, to expose more families of color to that experience. And we actually brought a few families from New Orleans to Friends for Life with me as well. Um, so it was really great to see the process of opening up to being more engaged with management happen in real time. Um, like the kids that came with me, I watched them. They were a little bit apprehensive at first, you know, going into like this very white space and, and not knowing what was going to happen or what the experience would be like. Or, or even I tried my best to just explain the benefits of being there. But I think it's something that you have to experience uh, firsthand to, to really get the the gist of what it's about. So it was great to see the kids just open up and make other friends. Because many of these kids, they don't know any. They're the only person they know living with type 1 diabetes. Yeah. So to see them make other friends that living with type 1 diabetes or at dinner, you know, to hear them discuss, you know, pre-bolusing and, you know, <laughs> how many carbs are in their meal. And just for them to be able to have those these conversations in this setting freely and not feel judged or not feel different. And by the end of it, you know, they're exchanging numbers. They've made friends. You know, they're definitely more engaged in their care. Um, I've checked in on a few of them and they're just a lot more excited about being healthy and doing the things that they've learned, that the takeaways from the conference. And I was excited to see them incorporating some of those lessons into to their own self-care. So it just lets me know that, you know, this can work if we expose the kids, specifically kids of color, if we expose them to these types of experiences, that it can have a positive effect yeah. in their lives and in their care. Can I ask you some Broadway type questions? Of course. All right. Okay. <laughs> Love it. All right. So we were fortunate enough to see The Lion King on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what an exceptional mm -hmm. show. I think most people are familiar with the incredible costumes, the staging, the dancing. I mean, it's just an incredible show. Tell us a little bit. You've played uh, so many different parts in that as I'm looking through your biography, right? What, what have you played in that show? <laughs> oh, my God. I played, I'm in the ensemble for uh, Lion King, but I've also understudied uh, uh, in Mufasa. Uh, and just being in the cast of Lion King has been just an amazing experience. <laughs> it's been like a dream come true. And it's also, it's one of, it was one of my favorite cartoons or, or, or animated movies as a, as a child. So to be a part of the cast has just been a dream. And being on Broadway and touring the country, oh. I mean, I've, I've, I've been able to see 
there. I mean, there aren't many cities that I haven't been to. Wow. Um, and Lion King is such a popular show that when we travel to the city, we get to sit for three and four weeks at a time. So we really get to engulf ourselves in the communities in which we visit. And that's actually been the, the best part. What's it like when you as the cast members come down the aisle? Because that is a breathtaking moment for the audience. And we're looking at these incredible <laughs> costumes and the character. They never break character. We're all ooh and on. Ah, there's got to be little kids poking you. Like, what is that like for you all? I mean, just seeing the, the excitement in the faces of the people. I mean, the kids are one thing, but I think the adults are, are just as excited <laughs> uh, to, to experience the show. I mean, I've had grown men come to me after, come up to me after the show with tears in their eyes, just talking about how moved they were by what they experienced on uh, from the stage, and you know, it's, it's really cool to be part of a show that is so um, ingrained in, in in our culture and so loved and um, so meaning. It means so much to so many people. It's just been an amazing experience being connected to the show. Unfortunately, I'm going to guess you haven't performed in a while. What's the latest with COVID and performances? Well, Lion King is opening up on Broadway September 14th oh. and then the tour in October. But, you know, I finally made the decision that I am uh, transitioning into like this, some of the new adventures in my life, uh, one of which is Kyla Care. You know, over the pandemic and having uh, time off really allowed me to um, just dig into the work we're doing here yeah. at Kyla Cares and the partnerships that we've been able to establish with other organizations. Um, and this work is so meaningful to me um, because I, I know personally just the difficulties living with type 1 diabetes. But I also, uh, I have personally experienced the triumphs of figuring out how to care for myself and how to still be a part of the things that bring me joy and how to do that safely. I want other kids, well, I want kids to know specifically that, you know, they can still do all of the things that they want to do in life and, and to really just give them the tools they need to, to lead a healthy life and to be normal kids, you know, and for the adults that are, that are living with this disease to know that, you know, if you engage in your care, things will begin to turn around and it, it doesn't have to be this horrific experience where it's just a steady decline in health and you can still lead a healthy life with type 1 diabetes. Kyle, before we wrap it up here, I know your phone's probably going to die. Let me just throw a few rapid fire Broadway type <laughs> questions and then we'll wrap it up. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. Has your Omnipod ever gone off on stage? Like, have you ever had an alarm or a Dexcom alarm during a, a performance? Oh, my God, yes. Oh, I mean, really? It is so embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, I, I've had my pod cancel on stage, so I'm, like, just standing there, and it's going off. And, uh, and, and I mean, it, what can I do? <laughs> 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 I try to, I, you know, I did my best to try to avoid those moments. But I remember one time, uh, this is a funny Omnipod story. My Omnipod uh, expired and my PBM was in my dressing room, so I didn't have time to run to get it. So I took the Omnipod off uh, with it still blaring and just put it in the trash, mm. which was near the stage, but, you know, far enough to where it could be heard from the stage. Well, after about two scenes, I come off stage and I see all of this commotion, stage managers and security for the theater hovering around this trash can trying to find out what's this loud glaring noise oh. and is it dangerous? Like, do we need to stop the show? And I'm like, no, I'm so sorry, but it's my pod. And I explained it all and it turned into a, a, a funny moment, but uh, it, it was not, it, the security was not amused. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that can happen for sure. I'm sure people are going to ask me to ask you just, you know, you've talked about how you kind of learned to figure out your blood sugar, to figure out your eating. You know, you've, you've figured out, you've been able to figure out what works for you on stage. And I'm curious if you mm -hmm. had any advice for kids who are doing school plays or adults who are performers. Well, this, you know, the thing that really helped me out, honestly, was 
really learning how to incorporate the technology into my mm-hmm. care and leaning heavily on my CGM and all of the information that it was uh, delivering to me and which allowed me in turn to respond to what my glucose was doing or any fluctuations that I was having or experiencing. And it, it really just helped me to not not having to finger prick and wait for that information, which is limited because it doesn't let you know, doesn't inform you if your glucose is rising or falling. So just having that information just made a world of difference and um, allowed me to really just care for myself when I was performing. And it also allowed me to focus on what I was doing as opposed to just being so concerned with my glucose. Before I let you go, how can we help Kyler Cares? What do you need from us? Unfortunately, because of COVID, um, we've had a really difficult time with fundraising. All of the, our, the fun ways in which we would go about raising funds have, um, have sort of been snatched from us. We did a fundraiser called From Broadway with Love, where I incorporated a uh, there's a concert of, of love songs performed by artists that are currently on Broadway um, from shows like Book of Mormon and Hamilton and Lion King, of course. So during the shutdown, we produced that and presented it virtually. Uh, we were going to present uh, the live version of that uh, in New Orleans at the Singer Theater, which is the theater that houses most of the Broadway shows that visit the city. But unfortunately, um, New Orleans is like one of the hot spots yeah, for yeah. this fourth this fourth wave of the, the pandemic. So, you know, Children's Hospital and the other um, healthcare uh, facilities that we're partnering with in the city don't think, and neither did we felt comfortable with a, a, a live gathering of, of twenty eight hundred people with all that's going on. So. And we're just trying to figure out, you know, the best ways to raise funds and how to continue connecting with our community uh, because it, it, COVID's making it really difficult to gather. Um, and it's something, that, that's, it's something that's really important as it relates to sharing this information with one another. Helping with um, donations would be great. Also, just more people of color just sharing their stories as well. Um, we find that the more visible we are, the more people can see themselves, the, the more it helps with just feeling that you're a part of and it helps with confidence building and the reduction of stigmas and just knowing that you're not alone. So those are two ways people can, can really help. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for coming on, for sharing your story. I hope this the break, I'm going to call it, from performing isn't the end of your performing. So keep Not us posted. At all. all right, good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Great. Well, keep us posted. Yeah, I, I, I most definitely will. I'll, I'll let you know. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, again, producing one of the things, you know, feeding my artistic muscle. Uh, I was really excited about producing these shows from Broadway with Love. And yeah. I hope I can get back to that because the first one was a lot of fun. So if people haven't seen it, I, you can go to our YouTube channel and, uh, and check it out. But um, yeah, I want to get back into that when things, when COVID uh, yeah. allows us to do so. Excellent. We look forward to it. Thanks so much for joining me. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. A lot more information on Kyle, on Kyler Cares. You can find it all at diabetes-connections.com at the episode homepage. There's a transcription there as well as there is for every episode. I was so excited to talk to Kyle. Some of you may know I'm just such a real Broadway fan. I love musicals. I highly recommend Schmigadoon on Apple TV if you haven't uh, watched that yet. (laughs) It's very entertaining and fun. I had actually talked about starting a Broadway type podcast during COVID. I still may do that. I have it in the back of my head how I want to do it, but it's going to be so much work (laughs) the way I want to do it. So we'll see. Maybe next year. I don't know. I'll keep that in my back pocket for a while. All right. Big thanks to Kyle for coming on. And coming up, I'm going to talk a little bit about back to school, what it looks like in my house this year, and also some feedback about our last episode, Betty's Big Trip to Israel. 
But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And, you know, I do get a lot of questions about Dexcom coverage for people on Medicare. And why not? It's not like you stop needing a CGM the minute you turn 65. The good news is that the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitoring System is covered for Medicare for patients who meet the coverage criteria. If you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes and intensively manage insulin, you may be covered. To find out more about what that means and if you qualify, go to Dexcom.com backslash G6-Medicare. I will link that up this episode. Don't worry about writing it down. You're going to want to talk to your doctor and you may even be able to get your Dexcom supplies at the pharmacy, saving time and money. Learn more. Here's the link, but it's over at the homepage, Dexcom.com backslash G6-Medicare. All right. I was very worried, as you know, about the episode with Benny, because as you heard, if you heard, he was far from perfect when he went by himself to Israel, which I didn't expect. I didn't expect him to be perfect. But, you know, I see a lot of parents who post on Facebook and want their kids to stay under six for their A1Cs and never go above 130 on the Dexcom. And, you know, we don't live like that at all. I wanted Benny to be honest and open. And boy, was he ever. It was interesting to hear him talk about what it was like and talk about diabetes camp. And, you know, gosh, I'm so thankful, knock on wood, wherever I can knock here. You know, he's a confident, happy kid. He's got strong opinions. And I really feel like he's going to be okay, right, after a trip like that. So the feedback I got was just fun. A lot of people reached out with their own stories. Karina wrote, thank you so much to both of you for sharing this experience. It's so valuable to see how a parent can continue to support their son and daughter in an age-appropriate manner. Lee wrote, I love that he's so transparent and genuine. I'm betting on Benny. Several emails and direct messages saying, thank you for being honest. It's really nice to know that we don't have to be perfect. Balancing independence and good, quote, diabetes health and numbers can be difficult. A lot of acknowledgement about that. But my favorite came from Joan, who emailed me and said, this reminded me of my 16-year-old adventure on a cross-country bus tour. We were still using urine testing. This is 1974. No CGMs, no pumps, no cell phones or texting. I have a similar well-adjusted attitude as your son, which has served me well through my 50 plus years with T1D. What I learned from this podcast was what a challenge it must have been for my parents. I have traveled the world, had my share of health issues, enjoyed my life, and I'm not eating celery crying in the corner. Oh, my God. I still can't believe he said that. Benny will be great. Thanks for sharing this story. Joan, thank you for sharing that email. And the funniest thing about it, I read it to Benny. He did not know what urine testing was. He had no idea that finger sticks weren't a thing at some point in in pretty recent history, 1974. So, you know, I I got to talk to him and explain. It's so funny. You know, he was diagnosed so little and he's not a diabetes podcaster or researcher. And I see what he doesn't know. It's so interesting. So, Joan, thank you so much for that. If I get any interesting stories or funny emails, I'll definitely share them as we go forward. But I want to just quickly bring up back to school, which, you know, ugh, is still looking so difficult in so many places across the country. And I I wish you all well, especially those of you with younger children. Oh, my goodness. So I've got two going back to school. My daughter is a junior in college. She is back. And my husband drove with her all the way to New Orleans where she goes to school because she's got her car this year. Thanks for giving me something else to worry about. Yay. But she's doing great. And Benny is a junior in high school and he's driving to school. Our school will start the day after this episode goes live. We're in the South, so they go to school before Labor Day. Growing up, I always went back to school right after Labor Day. But he's driving to school this year. I don't know when I'm going to see him. He's so busy. And right now, his school does have a mask order. We're in a very large public school system in North Carolina. And, you know, he's vaccinated. I assume that we'll get the booster shots as they roll those out. But it's going to be interesting to me. I mean, he goes to an enormous high school. It is, I want to say there are 650 kids in his class, in his grade. So it's a very big school. It's a crowded school. So we'll see how this works out. He expects to be back virtually in school very soon. Uh, I don't know. But I will share that. I realized just today, I have to get all his diabetes stuff back and bring it to the nurse. And I know you're thinking, well, Stacey, you've done this every year since he was in preschool. How could you forget? Well, you know, with COVID, we haven't even been in the school. I went back 
I don't even know when. I don't know, last year, a couple months ago, could have been last week. I have no sense of time anymore. I went back and got all the stuff that we had left there from 2019, 2019, 2020, that school year. And I haven't been back to see the nurse since. So we're getting the school form signed. I got to put his stuff together and make a new kit. I, I'm, so we'll be doing that. And then, you know, he's, you know, Benny, he's super casual. He'll take his backpack everywhere. So he'll have supplies. But I like to have stuff at the nurse's office for him as well. And hopefully it's the same nurse because, man, she was great. And she totally got that he's super casual and just wants her to be there when he needs her and doesn't need her checking on him and a really terrific person. There are, at least at the time when he was a freshman, there were 21 kids at that school with type 1. And I'm going to assume there are more because I don't know about your town, but we're having more and more cases here. And that's not anecdotally. I just talked to the endo the other day and he said they have many more. And we'll, we'll talk about that on a future episode. You know, many people think COVID is sparking more cases of all types of diabetes. Before I let you go, take a moment to check out our YouTube channel. We are getting a lot of engagement there. I've got the In the News episodes over there. So if you don't know that we have a YouTube channel, it's just Diabetes Connections on YouTube. And all the episodes are there. If you prefer to listen to podcasts on YouTube, which many do, most of them are not video podcasts, it's just audio, but a lot of people like that platform. Also, the newscasts, though, are video. So if you want to see me play an anchor lady, you can head on over there and I'll link that up in the episode as well. Please subscribe if you head over there. You know, very simple. Just click subscribe on the, uh, on the YouTube channel. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanan, from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much as you listen. Next week, we are likely going to air the Afreza interview that I did over the summer. Still working on a few things, but it looks like that one is going to come through for next week. Very excited to get an update from them. They've been around for a while, but man, are they making a push ahead as they have more studies, more studies with children coming up and lots of interesting stuff from Afreza. And of course, the newscast Wednesdays at 4.30 Eastern Time live on Facebook. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here in just a couple of days. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.